but other birds are not so lucky. Today, I'm at Save Our Seabirds here in Sarasota, Florida. I'm here with David Pilston at uh, Save Our Seabirds. Uh, tell me how this all evolved. A lot of people might know this uh, facility as what it used to be called the Pelican Man. Uh, the Pelican Man was here from around uh, 1990 until uh, about 2004. And when the Pelican Man himself, Dale Shields, passed away, um, another person took it over and then it only lasted for a couple more years and then it went out of business. And then this facility was left vacant for a couple of years and was dormant. And the jungle sort of took over. and. Uh, uh, the, the habitats fell into disrepair and the whole facility was really pretty run down until 2008 when Save Our Seabirds moved in and um, started to uh, repair all the facilities, to reopen the habitats and to start rescuing birds again. And so we've been here now uh, about four and a half uh, years and uh, we're growing and getting a lot more visibility and people are starting to recognize us now as Save Our Seabirds rather than the Pelican Man. Tell me a little bit about the educational aspect. Well, you know, the core of our, of our uh, operation here is rescue, rehabilitate, and release. And so uh, we do release the vast majority of the birds that we rescue. But um, we have a dual purpose. Uh, really, our broader mission is education, uh, really preparing the next generation of environmentalists and conservationists. And um, so we have our Wild Bird Learning Center here. Birds that have been treated but are unable to be released are given permanent homes here in our Wild Bird Learning Center. We've got over 30 species here, ranging from birds of prey to shorebirds to seabirds and songbirds and, and even some exotic uh, parrots, which are a lot of fun. And so uh, visitors can come out here anytime, any day, from 10 to 5, and visit our learning center. But we also have some formal training programs. Um, we've got uh, oiled wildlife response uh, training programs, we've got bird rescue programs, we've got baby bird training, uh, care training programs. We've also got formal field trips that are fully accredited by the Sarasota County School System through uh, Ed Explore SRQ, where science teachers can bring their classes out here to get credit on their uh, curriculum with their field trips. We see it really as a broader mission, to, uh, the, it's the opportunity to get children and just youngsters really better in touch with nature. and. Um, You've heard of uh, ADD, and have you heard of NDD? It's Nature Deficit Disorder, and it's, it's, uh, it's an epidemic in America right now. Um, kids are just out of touch with nature, and we're trying to play our small part in fixing that, getting kids off the couch, away from their electronic devices, uh, showing that, that there's more, more birds than just angry birds. And so, um, you know, we're really trying to, to address that. And I mean, there are all kinds of uh, ramifications of nature deficit disorder, from just lack of sensitivity to nature to all the health problems that come along with people not being uh, allowed to go outside anymore and then get in touch with nature. It seems a lot of our politicians suffer from it as well. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> the lack of sensitivity to nature, it really carries through into a lot of aspects of life. Um, you just, you know, you, you, if you come out to save our seabirds, you can get face to face with birds that, um, it's just beautiful, delicate creatures, and uh, you can learn about the things that humans do that impact birds that you may not even think about. Uh, the three leading causes of injury that we see are from automobiles, fish hooks, and golf balls. And so the automobiles, that's pretty obvious. Fish hooks, we see those all the time. A lot of people don't understand the golf ball part, but um, our sandhill cranes like to congregate on golf courses, and those long spindly legs are very fragile, and so we see a lot of leg injuries uh, with our sandhill cranes that have been hit by golf balls. So uh, people that are just out there living their day-to-day -day lives, uh, if they become more aware of what's around them, and how fragile nature is, and how, how negatively we can impact them without even thinking about it, um, maybe we can prevent some of the injuries that we see every day. I, I notice you have quite a group of uh, sandhills that have leg injuries over there. It's very sad to see. Yes. Yeah, we do see quite a few of those, uh, but fortunately we've been able to uh, save many of them, and uh, many of them have been saved with help of prosthetic devices that were developed here uh, in conjunction with Kevin Carroll. 
Uh, you may know Kevin Carroll from the movie Dolphin Tail, where he designed the prosthetics for Winter the Dolphin, and he helped design the prosthetics that we use to uh, allow sandhill cranes to walk again, which allows them to eat and allows them to live. And so um, that's that's one of our uh, you know most most precious assets that we have here. Uh, on rare occasions, I have seen them in the wild missing a foot due to natural causes. Well, sometimes they're natural causes. They, they get uh, bitten by something or other. We really try to focus on the injuries that are human caused. I mean, you know, nature is nature. And so, um, you know, one of our philosophies is everything's got to eat. And so, you know, there, are, there is a pecking order in nature that, that should take its course. We, we shouldn't really interfere with that. But too many of the injuries that we see are human caused, and those are the ones where we try to intervene and fix them and hopefully even prevent them. I, I noticed you have an angry bird over here, but it's not the game. No, no, <laughs> he, just, he just wants attention. <laughs> he just wants attention. Our, our parrots, our cockatoos, uh, and our blue and gold um, macaws, they, they love human interaction. And uh, if it happens to be a quiet afternoon here and we don't have many visitors in the learning center, they start squawking because they want to talk, they want to <laughs> sing, they want to interact, they just they crave that interaction. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to me about this. Well, thanks uh, for coming out, it's my pleasure. You're welcome care. out here anytime. Great, great. As is everyone else. I, I, I probably will be out here again. Good, <laughs> wonderful, thanks. Right. Uh, there are two baby uh, grackles that fell out of a nest. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. We don't have them aged by the by um, the medical. I don't have an age written down. But they are fledglings. They've got, they've, they're getting their adult feathers in, even though they, you can see the baby fuzz on the head. They also have, are growing in their adult feathers, but they don't have the flight feathers yet. Long enough to sustain flight. And as you can see, yes, yes the water um, is really, really crucial with birds. As we're doing this, uh, we try, really try not to talk to the babies. Um, try to minimize our, our, our socialization with them. It is hard, though, sometimes. Right, and as you can see, they're also pretty demanding. <laughs> so, so they're 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 not gaping any longer. You know, they're settling down. So I'm going to go ahead and cover them up for for now. And then I mark down on the chart what I just fed them. Um, ordinarily, it says on here that I should be feeding them the, the bird chow, which we use the crane chow. Mealworms, eggs, grapes. Um, but because we're just starting out this morning, I wanted to get something into them. So I just, right now, I just gave them the mealworms to settle them down. What should someone do if they came across a couple of baby birds that are falling out of the nest? She would be a much better person. What you should do, unless the bird is in immediate danger of being attacked by a predator, such as a cat or a dog, or out in the middle of the street, say, you should just observe the baby because often when they are ready to leave the nest, they're called the fledglings, okay? And they, they get down on the ground, but the parents are around and they are making sure that they have food. You might not see them for immediately, but if you would just observe them uh, for, you know, like I said, if they're not in danger, there's no harm. If they're like at the bottom of a tree or something like that, just see what happens because 99% of the time you will see a parent come down and bring food to that baby. And then it's a weaning process. They'll gradually bring them less and less. The little ones, you'll see them, they're trying out their wings and stuff like that, and that's how they how they get out, you know, they don't just hop out of the nest and fly away like that. So, um, so we, a lot of the birds that come in here that are in the fledgling stage, we think that well-meaning people have brought them in and, you know, but once you've brought them, 
Uh, there is a fallacy that if you touch a bird, the parents will not have anything to do with it. That is not true. Birds do not have a good sense of smell, and that just is not. That's a fallacy. It's, a, you know, I guess an old wise tale you could call it. Um, other than that, you can also, if you find one that's very young, there, there's several stages. There's what we call hatchlings, which are the very, very just out of the egg. They're, they're basically, they, they have, they can be almost naked looking like an embryo. They have no feathers. Um, then, and they cannot survive outside, you know, without, unless you bring them in here and even then it's very, very hard to keep them alive. Then from that, the next stage would be what we call a nestling. This is where they're starting to get the beginnings of their feather growth, uh, but they're still being fed constantly by the parents and they cannot survive outside of the nest. Then hatchling, then fledgling, which is when they're just about ready to go. And then, of course, juvenile is when they're, they're on their own, but not fully, fully adult. Okay. Uh, if you find young ones that have fallen or, the, you know, the nest has fallen, you can make a fake nest or a substitute nest out of a hanging basket or even something like this. You can put leaves or moss or grass in it and try and get it up in a tree and if the parents are around they will come to the babies that's something you can try um but if you know there's a question then you should bring it into a place that has a rehabilitator because it's really hard to raise a wild bird on your own well, ducks are um quick and they jump so uh and they you put them in those things and they'll just come right out there's a little Little baby duck. I don't know what he is. No, I don't. He could be a Muscovy. He could be a Mallard. He could be a Teal. It's hard to say right now. So, yeah. Treating him as the same person. You don't have to. They don't do like the song. No, that uh, I'm. We make up uh, either something called flock razor, which is something you buy at the feed store. And we soak that in water, it makes like a mash. And no, they generally eat on their own. So the mother bird uh, does not they, feed them. Not like, not like a, a mockingbird or a blue jay or a cardinal or a robin, no, no. So, yeah, own, yeah, they are. If own. they are not, uh, for some reason, eating, there is some food in here, and I'm going to make them a little plate, then we would have, the hospital staff would feed him with a tube until he gets started and eats on his own. But they're generally pretty easy to, you know. And in here we have, see if I can get catch one for you. These are downy woodpecker babies. They look like they're pretty well uh, mobile. Yeah. Woodpeckers, um, the reason we put them in these mesh cages is they, they don't perch unlike, um, well, some of the other birds, like the blackbirds over there or a mockingbird. <laughs> can, you get, can you see him? Ah, he's hungry. He wants some wormies. And their diet is... Uh, uh, mealworms, primarily insects that they get, you know, out of the tree. Here we feed them our basic baby diet. Again, small pieces of scrambled egg, small pieces of cut up grapes, and some of those soap pellets, plus as many mealworms as they care to eat. And they eat a lot of them. They, they are more clingers. They cling, you know, to the barks of trees. So we put them in here because they will cling to the sides of this mesh. What, uh, what are the most common birds that we get in here? The most common are um, mockingbirds. We get blue jays. We only have one blue jay so far, but this is really kind of the, the beginning of the baby bird season. Uh, a lot of doves. We get woodpeckers, um, ducks, baby ducks. We get occasionally we'll get cardinals, you know. Um, we have the little tufted tit mice yeah. over here. In Florida, the baby bird season seems to start pretty early and it seems to go forever. Runs from, from April through probably, I think it's July or August. 
Uh, now, some birds, like doves, they can breed year-round. They're, they're not necessarily confined. Now, we also get, uh, on the other side of the hall, is where they have the, um, the larger birds and the seabirds and the birds of prey. We get in, uh, we've had quite a few um, baby owls this year and some red-shouldered hawk babies. So, but they, they go over there. They're a different um, category, so to speak. These are screech owls. That one on the, the far uh, right, he's the oldest one of, of the bunch. And then far left is the second oldest, and then the middle one is the third, and then there's one in the nest who's the, who's the youngest. Well, first thing we do is we try to um, see whatever is wrong with them. You know, we see if they have any broken bones, if they're dehydrated, then we'll give them sub, some subcutaneous fluid through their skin. Um, and then we'll stabilize them, let them relax, rest, um, get, get back to however, you know, they're supposed to act normally. And then uh, we'll, we'll give them their live prey, we'll hand feed them, we'll tube feed them, uh, and then we'll eventually put them outside, put them with surrogates, surrogate moms, and they'll learn how to eat. And then eventually they'll be released when they can fly and they have all their feathers. Like, see, they're, they're still very, very fuzzy, and they can't fly yet. Some of them can't even perch yet. We build them a, a small nest. We, we turn on the heat so that they stay nice and warm, like if their mother was there, uh, you know, keeping them warm. And we, depending on the breed or, or the, the species, we, we, uh, we feed them in different increments of time. Like, like when these babies first come in, they need to be fed every half an hour till about sunset. And then again at sunrise. And they just eat little bits at a time, and then that's why they just have to be constantly fed and uh, hydrated. I imagine it's very rewarding, though. Definitely rewarding, especially when you can, you know, a lot of times the people that bring them in, the rescuers, they request to be part of the release. So we call them when they're ready, and then we take them to the area where they were located where they were first found, and then we release them, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I was going to originally be helping out on grounds, but then uh, after a few days, they realized that they needed somebody up here, and they trained me to be up here. And I've been here for about two and a half years now. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I love it here. There's a saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Actually, birds in the bush are priceless.